Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out. Um, I came from Crescent City. I never know how to get to Makati at this time, so I budgeted two hours and 30 minutes to get here, and yet I was still texting Gwen uh, while I was uh, in Katipunan telling her, you know, it might take three hours. I don't know. There's this kind of paranoia that the traffic induces. And if you're from Quezon City, your idea of how far Makati gets more warped and warped and warped every day, especially since three years ago, it would be easy to invite me for a drink in Makati. I would say yes. Um, now it takes uh, Reader's Festival and my favorite friends from Anvil to get me to come here, which is a very high bar since I really appreciate Anvil and um, Gwen, um, Annie, and of course, uh, Karina Bolasco. So I'd like to thank them for inviting me here. I am here through a rather circuitous route, not just EDSA and the uh, roads that Waze uh, led me to get here. And as you know, Waze can get very cir circuitous because it's trying to avoid traffic all the time. So I mean that in a literal sense, but I also mean that in a figurative sense. Uh, I am a historian by training, um, and so I, I like to speak about history but I have taught in a Southeast Asian department. I have taught in a politics department. I'm actually currently now teaching in a development studies department, but my core discipline is still history. Um, and the ironic thing is uh, every year, regardless of what department I am, I always find, I, I always end up begging the people at Ateneo to have me teach history courses. And now after, I think, six years of not being able to teach history, I'm finally teaching history again, so I'm teaching Philippine history. And so it's been a very, very exciting semester for me, which allows me to indeed revisit this question of how do we teach history to millennials? Uh, and I'm going to answer this with a, proviso, with a proviso of, I've only actually been teaching history again since six years for two weeks. So I'm actually not the expert on this. I just started teaching Philippine history again two weeks ago, and I'm not sure how well I'm doing. So the answers are going to be very, very provisional. But I want to divide my discussion into a couple of questions. Number one, what is the millennial? Number two, how do I teach them? It's very personal because I, knew I can only talk for myself. Number three, what is the problem? Because I find that whenever, whenever, whenever somebody asks me to talk about millennials, there's a problem there. Namely, they can't be understood. So what is the problem? Or for the more politically active, they're pro-Marcos Dao. So, uh, and then, finally, what do I try to impart to them? So, I was a college debater, and so I ha always have to stick to this outline that I present in the beginning, and then I summarize it, and then I outline it again. It's a very obsessive way of speaking, so bear with me. So, what is the millennial? So, last night, I was looking for um, age ranges for millennials. It can range from as early as 1980, or sometimes even the late 70s, or as, uh, to as late as the 2000s. So if you were born in 9-11, some people would still consider you a millennial. Uh, the best, the, so, so if you were to average them though, I think the average start dates and the average end dates are 1980 and 1995, which is a very good kind of, which are, which are very good dates for me because I'm able to play around with the biggest age gap within the millennial demographic every day. Why do I say that? I was born in 1984, so I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an old millennial. And my two brothers were born in 1990 and 1992, so they're relatively young millennials. And so I'm able to test whether or not this category really works every day, and I'm able to test whether or not age gaps exist within the millennial category. Although I have to say that with the proviso of because they're so young, I sometimes wonder if the age gap disappears because they turn me into someone who is more immature than I should be. Um, but anyway, so 1980 to 1995. On the one hand, that's actually very broad. It's a very broad demographic. Now let's just look at it from music, for example. The late millennia, the, early, the, the older millennial like me, I grew up, my pop music was the Backstreet Boys. I mean, we also had, you know, non-pop stuff. We also had Nirvana. Uh, we also had, of course, um, the grunge scene. And locally, we had the Eraserheads. But when you're looking at just pop music, our pop music was uh, Backstreet Boys, Brit Brit, and uh, all the other boy bands. Uh, my favorite, of course, will always be the Backstreet Boys, although my favorite singer of the entire generation was J.C. Chazé. I think this is a great musical context to grow up in. Contrast that to my brothers. My brothers 
their pop was actually emo rock. So they had to listen to this terrible band called Fall Out Boy in the early 2000s. A really pretentious bad band in the 2000s called Fall Out Boy, which, uh, which committed the grave sin of, co of providing a terrible cover of Love Will Tear Us Apart. So I always tell my brothers, I had a better childhood than, than you, because if you compare Fall Out Boy to Backseat Boys, I will always have the upper edge. Because I beat them to, to the head with that, they've kind of actually conceded it. You know, they've conceded grudgingly that I had a better childhood than them. But that's just music. I mean, let's look at the divergences when it comes to politics. My earliest political memory was I was in my mom's room and she was cursing that SOB gringo. You know what's happening here? These are the coups. They're the coups. Uh, the Cory Aquino coups. I think my brother's earlier mem earliest memories would be Arab. This is a big gap. This is a real big gap. Uh, either Arab or maybe uh, very late Ramos. Although nothing was really happening in the late Ramos period, so the, oh, the first crisis they'll probably remember, Edsa Dos, or Edsa Tres, insofar as people still remember Edsa Tres because the media really didn't cover Edsa Tres. So this is a huge gap. Uh, and so it's very different because I still have some taste of crisis, and people slightly older than me will have a, ve will have a memory of the Edsa Revolution. And that's a big difference between the Edsa Re Revolution, the real Edsa Revolution against the toppled era, uh, Estra uh, the toppled uh, Marcos, and the uh, kind of Pipichugin cheap Edsa Revolution that we were all exposed to, the toppled era. It's a, it's a big difference. It's a big jump. Um, so it's very different. And there's a lot of gradation within that generation. And it takes a lot of immaturity on my part to try to keep up with my brothers. Um, but in certain respects, actually, uh, millennials are the same. I mean, this is kind of cliche. Uh, we are natives of the internet. Um, and I don't want to belabor this cliche point, so I'll just tell a funny story about it. Um, these days, we are, my brothers and I are addicted to Waze, and we always use Waze wherever we go. Many times when we're on a Sunday and our father insists on driving, he'll go, Bakit pa kailangan mag -waste? I know how to get there. Plus, nagkakamali yan. And my brothers and I have, have this refrain already in the back of the car, Pops, trust the tech. And, and, and if he insists not to use waste, we'll start cheering, trust the tech. Trust the tech. Um, that kind of trust in technology is something that's absent in my father's generation. I mean, you'll, you'll see it also. So, you know, I ask my students, how do you know if an Uber driver started out driving a cab and an Uber driver started driving out with Uber. The Uber, the latter, will automatically turn on Waze, right? If, if, the, cab drive, if the Uber driver was a cab driver before, you have to convince him, Manong, pakituksan po yung Waze. Sige na, alam ko magaling kayo, pero mas magaling technology. I mean, it's really emas this is a generation that feels emasculated by technology because they used to be able to do things on their own. It's a kind of machismo, I don't need tech. Whereas there's a kind of humility, actually, to the internet generation. We're not, you know, we're happy to export some part of our brains onto the computer, but hopefully that allows us to do some things better. So in that sense, it's the same. Although, you know, if I ask my brothers, do you remember MIRC? They don't, diba? Uh, do you remember ICQ? Maybe. But really, they started out with Yahoo Messenger. So there's still variations, but more or less, I think the generation is defined by being able to trust the tech. Um, but here's the other big thing that defines, I think, millennials. Um, we have no experience of major crisis. No experience of major crisis, except for the very, very old ones, as I said earlier, who remember the EDSA revolution. Think about it, diba? Right? The generation before us, Either they ex experienced the first quarter storm, or, or the, our parents experienced the first quarter storm of the 1970s. They experienced the, or if they're a bit younger, if our parents are a bit younger, they must have experienced the financial meltdown of 1983, the worst financial crisis we've ever had, precipitated by many things, like the death of Ninoy Aquino, but also the collapse of the, of the debt bubble. Right? We don't have an experience of that. Again, we have cheap versions thereof. We have a cheap EDSA, a 2001, poor copy, 
and we have an experience of the Asian financial crisis, which really did not hit us as bad as the 1983 crisis, because as economists say, the Asian financial crisis didn't hit us so bad because we'd already experienced the worst in the early 80s via the 1983 crisis. So it is, in a way, what you would call literally, you know, in the 1970s, people like, like to say that they were lucky salayo. Actually, they weren't lucky salayo, you know, because they went through Marcos. But of course, for the previous generation, maybe they thought they were lucky salayo because they went through the Japanese and they went through the process of building an independent state. Now, what do I think is the implication of an entire generation not having experienced um, major political or economic crisis. I think it, the, the implication there is that they take liberal democracy for granted. This is something new in the history of the Philippines. If you look at from Rizal onwards, every Filipino generation has fought for some form of liberal democracy. So if you look at the generation of Jose Rizal, they were fighting the Spaniards because they wanted the kind of liberalism in Spain to be imported here in the Philippines. I think re recent research has shown that the Katipunan and the Malolos government were uh, almost doubtlessly liberal revolutions. Okay, so they fought for that kind of liberalism in an anti-colonial manner. The generation maybe that followed them, they say the generation of people like, and, and I work on these people, uh, I'm, I'm writing a book on this generation, the generation of Camilo Osias, the generation of Salvador P. Lopez, Carlos P. Romulo, Salvador Araneta. These are my pet intellectuals right now. Maybe, some, maybe they're not known to you because I think they're obscure. But anyway, that, that generation was the generation fighting for liberalism or the creation of a liberal state amidst decolonization from America. So they wanted an independent state that would be ostensibly a liberal democracy like America. The generation that followed that was the generation that perhaps fought the Japanese. So they fought the Japanese, and they, were, they, they had to stare a kind of state fascism in the face, Japanese state fascism. And of course, in that sense, they were also fighting for liberalism, although some of them were fighting for, like the hooks, were fighting for some form of socialism. But most of them were fighting for some form of liberalism. And then the Marcos era, which was the biggest challenge to liberal democracy. So because there's no crisis, we take liberalism for granted. This is the EDSA, re this is the EDSA revolution. We saw the emergence, and, to some, and some people think, the decline of the EDSA system, namely the, 1980, the, the system from 1986 to some people say 2016. Depends. Has change really come? Um, I mean, we don't know. But the point is, we take it for granted. And uh, that has implications, I think, on how I teach them, which brings me to the next question. How do I teach them? I don't know. Um, I don't know how I teach them. Uh, because, as I, again, as technically, although an old millennial, I'm, I'm a millennial myself, uh, technically, I was born in 84, we're of the same generation, so in a sense, uh, I don't have to adapt to them, although because you know, because I was born in the 80s, I am more inclined to like current music that sounds like it's from the 80s. So when I wax, uh, when, I, when I get excited over Carly Rae Jepsen in front of my, my, my students, I mean, I really love Carly Rae Jepsen, especially the, the, the latest album. When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm cheering for Carly Rae, they don't understand me. I mean, they know Carly Rae, but they like Taylor a bit better. So, so you know, kind of minor minor differentiations in taste uh, because Carly Rae sounds more like she comes from the 80s than Taylor. Um, but anyway, I don't, it's hard for me to, to, to really talk about how do I teach them because the gap isn't there yet. I am aware that this gap is growing and growing every year because I teach fourth year and uh, so I, 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 I stay put but the students continually change and so it gets a bit harder and harder. But I, I, I'm happy enough to say that, you know, more or less, I still dress like them. I still, I can still bump, bump into them in bars, although I try to avoid drinking in undergraduate bars. And uh, more or less, you know, uh, they, have fre they have friends of friends who have kuyas or ates who are my friends. Um, so in that sense, it's very hard for me to, to answer the question, how do I teach them? Because I just ride off the closeness to age now. Although there is one thing um, I emphasize, and uh, I don't know if this gets much traction, 
Uh, but as a teacher, the way I teach millennials in quotes is that my one rule is to give them a technological break. If you notice, I don't use PowerPoint. I hate it. You know, I really hate PowerPoint because as Steve Jobs says, if you know what you're talking about, you don't need to use PowerPoint because it's a kind of safety net. Right? But if, you, if you're confident, you have the PowerPoint. But it's not out of arrogance, that slight arrogance, uh, it's not out of arrogance that I don't use PowerPoint. Um, it's more because the kids, kids, millennials, have become reliant on tech. If you put a PowerPoint there, basically they'll just say, can you send me the PowerPoint afterwards? And then they won't listen to you. If you put the PowerPoint there, they'll focus on the picture, they'll focus on the text, they'll not focus on the person talking to them. And I think classroom engagement is really about conversation. And uh, teachers um, who get attached to the PowerPoint forget about that. And here's the irony. In my colleagues, the teachers who have gotten most attached to PowerPoint outlines are not the younger ones, they're the older ones. Because it gives them a kind of stability because it prevents them from be being shocked by students. Because having no PowerPoint means you have no safety net. You can be shocked by something the students will say, or you can be shocked by the direction in which they'll take the conversation, which is the classroom. But I like it. I mean, I like it because that is the essence of conversation. And if you bring it to the classroom, I think there's something eternal there. You know, it doesn't matter if these students are millennials post-millennials, or even if I'm teaching somebody older than me, which you know, has happened on occasion, the, 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 the main point of teaching is, as you know, in Tagalog, is nagtuturo, you point them in the right direction, and then you have a conversation with them. So that's the only thing I'll say on the question of how do I teach them. Um, now, what is the problem? Uh, what is the problem? It seems to me that whenever people ask about millennials, there's kind of a, an interoperability problem here because they don't understand the framework of the millennial. Um, on, off the cuff, I'd like to insist that millennials are you know, similar. They're human beings in the sense that you engage them in a sincere conversation, face-to-face -face conversation, remove the tech, remove the distractions, they listen. And if you ask them the right questions, they'll respond. And that's a universal. People like getting asked questions that allow them to talk about their own life stories and life histories. And that's uh, a non-millennial thing. But I get that there is indeed a concern about distractibility, the growth of ADHD. I have ADHD. Uh, yeah, you know, I have ADHD. Uh, and my brother has ADHD also. Uh, I get that there are these concerns. Um, so that, for example, uh, I teach at the Ateneo de Manila, when we ask teachers, um, what classroom training session would you like to have the most? So everyone in the faculty voted. <laughs> the number one question was the question I'm answering now, how do you teach millennials? Because they think that it's a different generation. You know? and, and the complaints are samotsari. So distractibility is a cliche complaint. Another complaint, at least from, from at, because I, I teach in a very specific context, Ateneo, the other complaint is that they can't speak Tagalog. Uh, can't speak Tagalog. And this is actually, I think, um, explainable by the fact that, it, if I may be permitted, I have ADHD, if I be, may be permitted a slight digression, I think one of the reasons why a lot of Ateneo millennials can't speak Tagalog is because of cable TV. It's because when I was growing up, and this is another distinction within the millennial class, huh? I, was, I grew up without cable. So when I turned on the ABS-CBN, I would get, in the, mor in the morning, Tagalog and English cartoons. In the evening, I would get TV Patrol at 6. I would get million TV Patrol, which was in Tagalog. And then I would get Million Dollar Movies, which, which was in English, and then the late night news, in contrast to TV Patrol, was The World Tonight, which was in English. It produced bilingualism. Diba? My brother does not remember that ABS-CBN. My brother remembers, oh, I'll watch Cartoon Network, pure English. I don't need to watch ABS-CBN. And if he did watch ABS-CBN, he wouldn't understand it because it was pure Tagalog. Diba? If he ever saw news, it would be ANC. So it's that kind of bifurcation of the media that, create, that, that destroyed bilingualism in the country. That's why I'm a, that's why, again, intra-millennial differentiation, I'm a lot better in Tagalog than my brothers are. 
especially my youngest brother, whom I always tease of being, of being a UP conyo. Uh, UP, we can't speak Tagalog. And I'm the one from Ateneo, and I'm the one who speaks better Tagalog. But anyway, that's one problem that they, that they bring up. Um, distractibility, lack of Tagalog, etc., etc. Um, I don't have the answers. I'm not an education specialist. Um, so, in some ways, I, I think they, 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 take, they, they overblow this crisis because they're just paranoid and they want to do better. But on the other hand, I understand that there are these legitimate concerns. I don't think, however, that the interoperability concerns of millennials here in the Philippines are as big as the interoperability concerns of millennials against baby boomers in the United States. In the United States, it's gotten really bad because if you look at campus conflicts there, millennials have taken, taken to a kind of online activism that is hinged primarily on political correctness, right? That's why most of the struggles of millennials in the United States are about what do we rename this campus hall? What do we re rename this statue, right? It's, and, uh, or, or, or they're concerned about microaggressions. They don't like the fact that uh, their teacher called the transgender man uh, she, you know? Very, what the Filipinos who have elected Rodrigo Duterte, so we don't obviously, we obviously don't care about political correctness, right? What, what to us is, you know, is nothing, right? So it's a non-issue for us. But in the States, it's a big issue, you know, because the millennials have taken to political correctness as a kind of primary axis for their activism, whereas their elders were the elders who fought the Vietnam War, so they know real activism, right? Their activism is still directed against the state. That problem doesn't exist for us. We don't have this kind of crass, and I think it's crass, this kind of crass PC identity politics uh, millennial activism here in the Philippines. And, and, so I th and so I think that the problem is not so big. I actually don't think it's so big. So. Why, why, why should we even be talking about the problem of millennials? I think it's because it can be a problem. Um, and the it can be a problem relates to memory. So here I want to address the elephant in the middle of the room is because when you, the issue of talking history to millennials is really associated with one issue, namely the issue of Marcos nostalgia. Yeah. Marcos nostalgia. Everybody thinks that the millennials are behind Marcos nostalgia. Um, you know, my, I'm pretty open with my anti-Marcos bias. I think he ruined the country. I think he's not a hero. Um, so I'll get that out of the way. But anti-Marcos nostalgia is associated now with millennials. And that is why people in places like Ateneo are concerned. Because as you can imagine, Ateneo is largely anti-Marcos. Even in UP, you know, largely anti-Marcos, even in De La Salle. So they're concerned that millennials are becoming pro-Marcos. Now, and that they don't understand history. Now let me just challenge this notion a little bit because when Pulse Asia came out with its survey of those people who voted for Bongbong Marcos, it wasn't the millennials. It was actually the people in their 40s and their 50s. I forgot something in my bag I wanted to share. I'm going to share it with you. I don't like PowerPoint. I want you to handle the real thing. I could have flashed this as a, as a picture, but you know, please, please take care of it. It's one of my prized possessions. I'll hand it around. Guard um, the This is the first issue of the National Midweek. Uh, people who are not millennials, who are older than me, how many of you remember the National Midweek? The National Midweek was published in 1985. And it was an attempt on the part of the people who used to be associated with the Philippine graphic, with the Philippines free, free press, to return the vibrancy of pre-Marcos media. Because they thought that Marcos had practically killed the media and had brainwashed a generation of people. Now, look at the cover. It says, remember the Philippines free press, the weekly graphic, the Asia Philippines leader. Remember the in-depth reportage, the hard-hitting exposés, the incisive analysis, the investigative and interpretative reporting, the freewheeling features and profiles, the award-winning fiction and poetry. Remember Quijano de Manila, Nico Quin, Napoleon G. Rama, Wilfredo D. Noledo, uh, Gregorio C. Brillantes, Lacaba, other names. So what's the assumption here? The assumption here was that the forgetting started in the 80s. In other words, if you 
gained political consciousness in 1971, say you were 13 in 1971, and in 1985, you would be 20-something, right? I, I'm bad at math. I'll pass this around. Okay. Pass this around. Please give it back to me. The assumption was you were raised on Marcos propaganda, di ba? Your entire life from 1971 until 1985. So the assumption was the forgetting already happened there. Notice, that generation, not millennial. Diba? That generation is not millennial. And if you look at the statistics who voted for Marcos, it was that generation. So the problem is not that millennials are not interested in history. The problem is the Gen X was brainwashed by Marcos. I think that's... that's so, so this problem of millennials not understanding history, I think, is overblown. I think that millennials are a lot more open-minded when it comes to the thorny issues of history. For instance, I was, uh, for instance, you know, millennials will ask you a lot of questions about what they get on the internet. The other day, I was asked, is it true that Ninoy Aquino was behind the Plaza Miranda bombing? Now, to some who value the reputation of Aquino, it's a very offensive question. But actually, there's a glimmer of truth in that because Ninoy Aquino was allied with the Communist Party at the time, and I, you know, I, I asked the chairman of the Communist Party, I looked at U.S. State Departments, and the State Dep I asked at least four members of the Communist Party, including one former chairman and one former secretary general. I looked at documents from the State Department, and I looked at some writings from Aquino himself, and I was able to verify this quite easily. Okay. And as we know, the Communist Party was behind the Plaza Miranda bombing. So even that question, which seems like a lack of appreciation for history, which they got from the internet, actually opens up questions about history. So instead of thinking, I mean, sometimes, yes, yeah, social media, it can lead to brainwashing. But instead of thinking of it as something that leads to brainwashing, why don't you think about it as an initial spark that will allow for a good classroom conversation? And that's always how I treat these questions from millennials, so to speak. All right, so the final question. How do I teach, uh, what is, uh, rather, what do I try to impart to them? Uh, this semester, I concluded that even if I'm a history and politics teacher, I will only leave them with one message, which is to read fiction, read good literature. Um, I know it's kind of weird, but the polarized nature of our politics is a politics that lacks empathy. It is a politics that says, all the tertards are stupid. If you like Noy Noy, you are a yellow tart. Kill the drug pusher. Bobo yung probinsyano. Kasi nagpaloko kay Duterte. Both ways. It works both ways. It's a kind of lack of empathy, not understanding where one side is coming from. Unfortunately, alas, political analysis, historical analysis, can only approximate the kind of humanity that fiction can provide. So once you know the facts from history, once you know the facts from politics, the next step is to get the empathy of being able to look at people as holistic characters with motivations, with needs, and not simply as demons or good guys or bad guys. Because the best fiction is ambiguous. And so if th I think that if we are able to revive the liberal arts through fiction, the humanities in the Philippines, if we are indeed able to read, again, Quijano de Manila, Nick Joaquin, Gregorio Brillantes, I think this is a solution, not just to the impasse of the interoperability between millennials and whatever generation you're talking about, but the, the impasse of interoperability within the various political groups in this country. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Okay. I'd like back. my midweek back. <laughs> okay, the issue one. prized midweek. Can somebody... Um, there it is. Okay. Uh, if it hasn't made the round, so yeah. Okay. Fine. So, um, thank you, Leloy. Thank you very much for, uh, for that um, very enlightening presentation. Certainly uh, will keep us thinking for the rest of the weekend. 
Uh, just a quick question. May I know who are the teachers am among us here? Are there any teachers in the group? Hello. Hello, teachers. Thank you for coming. Okay. Uh, we have time for two questions. So are there questions? Yes, sir. Um, can you please identify yourself before you state your question? I'm actually uh, Joey Molina. Hi, sir. Uh, I'm no longer a millennial, it looks. Uh, and I'm uh, connected with uh, an employer sector. I just want to find out, really, uh, right now, uh, what would you, how do you look into uh, this particular Duterte? Duterte, uh, shall we say, situation? Okay, because, uh, well, uh, it's really hard to, uh, to be saying something about, uh, about uh, Duterte right now because you might just turn out to be uh, a male de Lima. But uh, your, your, your foresight into, uh, into what is happening, particularly the drugs, criminality, etc. I think uh, it's a natural response to, I'm a critic of Duterte, I'll put it out there. Um, so I am, I unfortunately belong to the class of individuals known as human rights advocates. We used to like them, uh, not as much these days. Uh, I'm a critic, and I think, but I do understand why it happened. And one of the reasons why it happened is because the EDSA system has not provided and so somebody who challenges the EDSA system categorically is likely to win. I mean, just look at the drug problem, for instance. So the other day, I mean, you can do this. Pull up all the saunas of President Benigno Aquino. Pull, pull them all up. And if you're a millennial, you know the Control-Alt-F function, which is the search function. Search function, type in the keyword drugs, all six saunas. You will get three <laughs> matches. Type in the search word Shabu, you will get zero matches. Now, Shabu was a big problem in the Philippines 2009, 2012 pa lang. 2012, we were declared the Shabu, Shabu capital of East Asia. And yet, you had a president who almost barely mentioned it in his six son addresses. So, is it surprising that somebody comes up and says, we have a drug problem, I'm the only one who can solve it, that this person would gain attention when the previous administration didn't pay attention to it? Of course. So, you know, the liberal intellectual class, which is very critical of Duterte, thinks he's a new Marcos, who can complain about human rights all, all we want, because I include myself in that category, but unless we come up with an alternative to the drug war, people are not going to listen to us. And so it is about time to come up with a system through which we can really combat this this drug problem. Otherwise, we will uh, in the same way that the Lima is being cursed. And so this is this is the kind of this is the kind of discussion I want to have. Because again, if you turn the drug problem into an issue of um, policy as opposed to human rights pro duterte hindi, then the discussion will not be as heated. Diba? So you know now I refuse to engage in discussion on pro duterte ba ako hindi or uh, so, although sometimes I do, or pro-human rights ba ako hindi, the I, I bring it to a discussion of Oplan Tokhang and Oplan Double Barrel. Do those policies work? Because once you've made it cerebral like that, it's less emotional, uh, and, and the discussion becomes more democratic. Okay. One, one last question. Do we have one last, no? Uh, it's a follow-up for that one. Uh, where do you think, or will be after six years like uh where will these efforts go right. no i think your i know your your guess is as good as mine um but if if any ex if the examples of previous drug wars across the world are any indication it's not gonna killing is not gonna solve the drug problem because thailand did it too under um toxin right? um body count actually very similar to the tertus body count and yet we didn't get a significant dip in Shabu. Maybe, you know, uh, medium term uh, didn't happen. Of course, you know, next week, what's going to come out on Netflix, season two of Narcos, which basically shows you how long they had to fight the drug war before they were able to just apprehend the top drug lord, Pablo Escobar. 
So, you know, if, if we continue down this path, I don't think it's a good policy decision. But I do hope that if, I, I do hope that, that the question of how to deal with drugs remains a national issue because it's something that needs to be talked about, something that needs to be addressed. And blame can be placed squarely on the previous administration for not, not turning it into an issue and allowing Duterte to, to hijack the issue. Ah, uh, okay, the lady. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Micheline Suarez. I'm also from the Ateneo. One I don't month. teach, but I love my years there. Uh, I have a question about how I, I, am, I am a mother of three millennials. So I kind of understand some of the dilemmas in reaching them. One of the things that I notice is that they uh, prize open-mindedness to a fault that there is no more right or wrong. How do you address that? How do you reach them and, and tell them, yes, it's good to, be, to listen, but there's also a time to take a position. Are you talking about any specific issue, ma'am? Is there no, something that just, comes to mind? Uh, uh, right and wrong. Just, okay, there is right and wrong in history. And people say, some people say, oh, we have to keep an open mind because, because uh, times were different then, things like that. Even, uh, even in terms of morals, even in terms of, of absolute truth. How do you reach someone who prizes open-mindedness to a fault? I also think, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that question, but to put that in historical perspective, because I'm a historian, I, I'd like to think that, that that capacity to play around with different mindsets is a function of the historical juncture we're in. For instance, I think that people who grew up in the era of the war, like World War II, a lot of them might have had more categorical ideas of what was wrong, what was right, because it was clear that there was you know, fascism, and therefore um, the problem presents itself. Or even people who opposed Marcos. You know, uh, I think it was clear that this guy was, was a fascist and wanted to perpetuate himself with power. Now, for this generation, I don't think those certainties are as present. I mean, just look at Duterte. I mean, those my polit many of my political allies just want to pass him off as a Marcos who wants to perpetuate himself in power and stay and, and, and impose martial law. I don't think that's the case. He's too old. Diba? Obviously, his long-term plan is not to perpetuate himself and his family in power, and he just wants to go home to Davao. Diba? Uh, and uh, and uh, I don't think Indaisara has uh, ambitions of being the next Imelda Marcos. doesn't seem that way. Diba? So, even there, you, you can't be assured of that kind of certainty or, 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 you know. And in fact, it is sometimes forcing a kind of certainty on people that, that, that really turns them off. I think what happened, one of the reasons why you had a Duterte phenomenon is because there was a certainty being pushed on the public, namely the certainty of democracy Aquino's good, Marcos dictatorship bad. I think people got tired, and I think that created the atmosphere for charlatans like um, Thinking Pinoy and um, Thinking Pinoy and uh, what's the other one? Um, uh, Get Real Philippines to emerge. Um, so, so in order to avoid that kind of uh, explosion of uncertainty, uh, we should be liberal with respect to the uncertainty of people because if you force certainty on them, my suspicion is that the rebellion will happen. That's just my suspicion. 